Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Truth Defender podcast. We are coming to you from the greatest country in the world, deep in the heart of the Lone Star State, Dallas, Texas. I'm your host, Paul Aguilar. We really appreciate you guys stopping in for another episode. Uh, if you guys are catching us on YouTube and you aren't already a subscriber, please consider hitting that subscribe button, as well as that bell icon so you never miss an episode in the future also please consider hitting that like button or that dislike button that'll really help us out with the algorithms as well uh, if you guys are on the go and you want to catch us you can find us on spotify google Podcasts, apple Podcasts, as well as iHeartRadio at truth defender podcast uh, if you guys are following us on social media or you haven't already i'll have a list of all the social media we have down below um, we've got twitter instagram facebook rumble discord and all, all that good stuff um, if you guys have any questions or comments for myself or our guests, guests or topic recommendations, you can email us at thetruthdefender1776 at gmail.com. Our next guest we're really excited about is Pastor Carl Gallops. Carl Gallops is a longtime senior pastor at Hickory Hammock Baptist Church. He is the author of the bestseller, Magic Man in the Sky. Additionally, he is a conference leader, evangelist, and Christian media icon. Carl is one of the founders of Video Teaching Material to the World, uh, YouTube Ministry and Biblical Apologetics channel. He is a graduate of Florida State University and the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Without further ado, Pastor Carl Gallup. Sir, how are you doing today? Doing good, Paul. It's great to be with you, man. Honored. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for fading us in. Like I mentioned before, uh, I was really excited to speak with you. I've been looking forward to it for a while. Um, finally reached out. And we just kind of shot in the dark. Hopefully you would be gracious enough here, you know, to come on our show and you were. So I really, really appreciate it. No, it's my honor, man. I think we're connected on USA.life, aren't we? Are we? I, or MeWe or someplace. I can't remember. Uh, where we, I think MeWe. Um, Me Is it MeWe? Yeah, yeah. I've got a bunch of uh, <laughs> of social media uh, alternative as well as the the standard yeah. ones. And I, I'm surprised that I'm not kicked off of the standard <laughs> ones already, but for whatever reason, they're tolerating me. But, but yeah, I knew, I knew we had met on social media sometime back. So anyway, I, I'm honored to be here. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. So MeWe, I've been, so it's, it's a funny thing about MeWe. I've been on MeWe since before they even got started. I think I was like the first <laughs> 20 people that they ran like their trial with. Yeah. Um, so I've been on it since way, way back then when wow. there was nobody on there <laughs> at all. Yeah. Wow. No, that's a big deal now. I really enjoy that platform. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot. I'm on MeWe, USA, USA.life, um, Gab, uh, Wimkin, Orbeez, Parlor, Rumble, BitChute. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all of those plus YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and multiple channels on all of those. So. Right. Yeah. And I'm not really a social media uh, addict or anything. I just, I use, use it to put out information. You know, you're, you're on my right. MeWe site. You, you see what I do. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a bit of a hassle trying to keep up with all of them. Um, you know, here we're just like a smaller show and it's, when I say we, I say it's mostly me. Like I'm the one that, you know, has to get the guests and interview the guests and, and edit all the stuff that we put out, all the promos and all the posts. So it's just, so it's hard to keep up with everything that's going on, but yeah, we get there and, you know, we get it done. So that's You're great. just getting started, man. You're going to, you're yeah. going to, going to use you. you. You think you're busy now. You just wait. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a bit hard because it's, you know, with work and then school and then plus this and it's, yeah. Been it's, there, done that brother. Yeah. <laughs> but it's fun. I mean, I enjoy it. We're up and running at, at least about, I want to say 20 hours a day. So uh, we get very little sleep, but it's great. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's fun. Great. Well, God bless you, man. God bless. <laughs> I appreciate Again, it. Again, thanks for having me on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to kind of discuss here. Um, so your, your newer book here uh, is called The Summoning. Yeah, um, that's my very latest. Yeah. Right. When is, so when exactly did that book come That out? hit the deck January of 2021. Oh. Oh. Uh, but um, the one right before it, Masquerade, uh, hit the deck uh, March of 2020. So Ooh. there's less than, I don't know, 10 or 11 months in there between the two being released, right. uh, which is kind of an, an, an anomaly in the way it happened. So those two are, are my latest and, and man, the Lord is really using them both. I'm, I'm just so excited about what God's doing, the supernatural connected to both of those books. And, but um, yeah, in fact, the summoning 
let me just tell your audience in case they, well, I'm not here to sell books, but I, I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for, uh, for 35 years in one church. And prior to that, I spent 10 years in Florida law enforcement, two different sheriff's offices under three different sheriffs, did criminal investigations in one of those sheriff's offices. So I've got a lot of life experience and a lot of preaching and teaching experience and um, a lot of formal training in, in Hebrew and Greek and how to, dis, you know, to, uh, dis, uh, to, to discern scriptural co contextual connections. So I've been preaching and teaching for a long time. So what these books are, they're not things that I'm out here trying to hawk and sell. I, I don't. I just don't do that. But I write them, and then, I, then I'm published by major publishers, so they do all the marketing. But I write them so I can get all this stuff out of my head <laughs> that I've been <laughs> preaching and teaching, and people say, oh, that changed my life so much. You should put that in a book or tell me that again or preach that again. This way I can just hand some by the book. You know, or if I'm doing an interview like with you and we get into some really sensational stuff, I may say some stuff that'll shock people's you know pants off, but I can I can say, but look, I've got it all referenced with scholars and word studies and right out of mainstream, you know, sources, medical sources, science sources, archaeological sources. It's all in my book, like the summoning. Mm -hmm. And then that frees me up to just talk about the things that God has shown me rather than continually having to defend myself. And, and the thing is, is it just shows people that the things that I'm going to say, I didn't pull this stuff out of my back pocket. I mean, I've spent years, decades in research and doing all of the, the work necessary. Now, that doesn't mean that I think that everything I say is 1000% correct. It just means that it's, it's scholarly and and it's not out of my back pocket. I do have opinions, you know, and I, I will say, now this is my opinion. The Bible doesn't say this, but based upon everything else I know that it says, my opinion is this passage means this. So I just wanted to say that very quickly for your audience, because a lot of them may not have a clue what I do or, you know, who I am and everything. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so like, I wanted, I had like a kind of where the, the title of the book came from, the summoning, you know, where yeah. is that? Yeah. Is that no, from? listen, thanks. The, the title is The Summoning, and the subtitle is Preparing for the Days, the Coming Days of Noah, you know, in Luke 17 and in Matthew 24. And, and I say that like that because these two instances where Jesus spoke these words were several months apart from each other. Uh, the Luke 17 passage, he was on his way to Jerusalem to go to the cross, but he was several months out and he was coming down the Jordan. Uh, river road and then to Jericho, then up to Jerusalem, but he would spend time in each of the villages coming down. And it's recorded there that a group of Pharisees came out and met him on the road and said, tell us what are the signs of the coming kingdom, the coming age, the end of the world and the coming kingdom? Because see, Jesus is, in, he's near the end of his ministry now. And so he's been preaching and teaching the kingdom parables and the coming of the son of man. And so the Pharisees want to know again, you know, and so he tells them, but he ends it by saying, look, the coming of the son of man will be just like the days of Noah. Now those words just like are very emphatic. He didn't say kind of like, or similar to, or this is just an illustration. No, he said, it'll be just like the days of Noah. Then he said, and it will be just like the days of Lot. In other words, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, He's speaking of the last day, so he's speaking of all over the globe, not just in the United States or just in the Middle East or just in Europe or, you know, he's speaking there's this going to be this spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's going to be this spirit of, of thumbing your nose at God like they did in Noah's day. It's going to sweep the planet in the last days and all of the nations will kind of get on board with this politically correct speech and you know, and, and crushing down the word of God, crushing the people of God. Um, he said that in Luke 17, but when he got to Jerusalem and getting ready to go to the cross on the, uh, it's what we call the Olivet Discourse. He's on the side of the mountain of the Mount of Olives. He had spent the first day down in Jerusalem. And that night, the disciples asked him again, tell us again, What's the signs of the comings? And that's where that famous passage in Matthew 24, where he says, look, there'll be wars and rumors of wars, nations against nations, kingdom against kingdoms, false prophets, et cetera, et cetera. But he ends it by saying, 
learn the lesson of the fig tree. Boy, I spend two or three, four chapters about that. That's super important. I'm sure we'll talk about it in a little bit. And then he says, and don't forget, it'll be just like the days of Noah. He repeated it. So see, there's something huge there. And I unwrap it and unravel it and just dis and display the mysteries of what he's saying before the world in this book. And, and I connect from Genesis to Revelation, everything said about all of that, pull it together so that you have a very clear picture. And it's not a pretty picture, Paul. So the title, the summoning comes from Psalm 50, where it's speaking the first six verses, it's speaking of the very last days. And God says, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, I don't have it right in front of me, but I've repeated it so many times, I'll be very close. Right. But, but, but it says, the Lord God sits enthroned in heaven, and he summons the heavens and the earth to him before his throne, is what it means. And he summons them, he calls them to account, and he says, come here, come here, you fallen ones, come here, you from the earth, come before my throne. And you can tell that this is the day of judgment. I mean, and, if, and it says that in so many words, that this is the final days. He's summoning before the throne um, all of those that have rejected him and denied him. But I love it because it ends by saying, however, gather together my consecrated ones, those that are set apart unto me by the proper sacrifice. Well, the last days, the proper sacrifice is not a bull or a heifer or a goat on, on an altar or a lamb in the right. temple a day in and day out, the proper sacrifice of the last days is to come under the blood of Jesus Christ, who is the lamb of God and the fulfillment of all the temple sacrifices. So it's a powerful passage of scripture when the context is understood. And I took that, I took that, that continued repeating phrase of summons. He's summoning the heavens. He's summoning the earth. He's summoning before his throne because let's just face it, Paul, we're, <laughs> We're living in the most prophetic days since the first coming of Jesus Christ. We, we are living in the last days. Now, I, I, I don't set dates. And, and so when I say that, I know people say, well, every generation has said that. I know that. I talk about that in the book. Of course, I know that. In fact, Peter said in the very last days, in 2 Peter chapter 3, he said in the very last days, everybody's going to be saying that. Ah, oh, everything goes on as it has from the beginning. Then they will scoff and they will mock the word. They will mock what I'm saying right now and say, ah, oh, listen to that idiot. He's just another one of those, you know, it's the end of the world. It's the end of the world. Well, I've been preaching ever since I started in the ministry that we're getting close. It's coming closer and closer. And how do I know that? Because God's word gives us the starting point. It's the return of Israel a 2,800-year-old prophecy. That's what Jesus said when he finished all of that of Matthew 24. And then he said, now learn the lesson of the fig tree. And I, I unwrap that in the book, and I'll tell your audience exactly what that is in a moment. But, and then at the end of the lesson of the fig tree, it's a parable. He talks about when you see the fig tree bloom again and put on its leaves and shoot out its shoots, then you will know. He says, that generation that sees that will not pass away completely. In other words, I, I don't know what a generation is. Nobody does. All the scholars argue about it. Most of them agree that it's probably 70, 80 years, 90 years. A hundred years is a complete wiping out of a generation. So it's, it's in that 70 to 100 year period. Um, and, and Jesus said, but, but that generation that sees it come won't even pass away. So it'd be less than 70 or 80 or 100 years. And he said, and that generation will see all of this happen. Well, that's everything from these world wars. By the way, we're the first generation to be called the generation of world wars. Mm -hmm. The only two world wars the planet has ever seen has happened in the last 100 years or, you know, 120 years. So, mm -hmm. so here we are, but just 73 years ago from a couple of weeks from now, Israel was reborn. See, you and I are not 73 years old. So our entire lives, Israel has been on the maps right. and it's been in our life. But just before you and I were born, and I'm older than you, but I'm just saying, even I'm not 73. So just before you and I were born, there was no Israel. For 2,800 years, there was no Israel. But the word of God says over and over and over, 
God says, and I'm going to paraphrase and crunch them all together, but he says, in the last days, I will bring Israel back, and I will do this to show the nations that I am God, and beside me there is no other. No other God has ever done such a thing as this, he said, and I'm doing this to show that my glory to the nations. Why? Because it's the last days. It's now starting to wind down. It's like Noah building an ark for 120 years. Well, God has put Israel over there for 73 years. How, how long, if, if that's the blooming of the fig tree, and, and I can prove that to your audience here very quickly, that that's what it is. But if that's the blooming of the fig tree, well, then now we got to ask how long's a generation. And as I said, I don't know, but it's no longer than a hundred years. Right. And we're already 73 years into it. And Jesus said that that whole generation wouldn't even pass away. So we're close. We are very close, and there's a lot of unprecedented things that have happened just in the last 10 to 15 years and in the last year right. uh, that I catalog there in the book and pull them right out of the headlines and right out of the scriptures. When I say unprecedented, as you and your audience knows, that means it's never happened before to any generation, um, but it's only happened in our generation. For example, the return of Israel. Once it was gone, in five, six, seven hundred uh, BC, and you know Babylon, and then Persia, and Greece, and the, the Roman Empire came in. I mean, all of that. There was no Israel, and so we're the first year. You and I, we've grown up with Israel on the map, and both of us are not even as old as Israel is. So, man, that's that's. I mean, again, I don't set dates. I don't have a clue. I don't know. No man knows the day or the hour, but I sure know the season we're in. And that's what this book is about. I'm just trying to wake up the church, Paul. And I'm trying to give the church, the church, the book's very encouraging. I mean, I tell you, well, how do you live in these days? And what, what's our purpose in it? What's the church's purpose? What do we do when Satan closes down all the churches on the planet for Resurrection Sunday, for the first time since the birth of the church. There's another unprecedented prophecy. The Bible speaks about Satan in the last days attacking, launching an attack against the church, and by the way, the returned Israel. And one of the things that the Bible says, uh, doesn't use these words, but I've built the case in the scriptures that he does say, that it does say this, is that the church would effectively be put down. It'll be shut down. And I even point out the scriptures that say it, and I show you the scholars that have been saying that for hundreds of years, long before COVID, long before Israel returned. They said, that's what this means. Near the end, uh, the church is going to come under such severe persecution all over the world that it will be shut down. It will be put down. Brother, that just happened. We're still living in that prophecy. Now, I don't know if what we're living in is the ultimate fulfillment of it, but we walk through that door in March and April of 2020, just one year ago from today, we walked through that door of all of the governments around the world saying, uh-uh-uh, Resurrection Sunday, that's dangerous. You Christians are going to kill us all if you do this. Well, what is Resurrection Sunday? It's the one Sunday that celebrates the defeat of Satan. And Revelation chapter 12, verse 12 says about those last days, woe unto you earth in those days, because Satan will have been thrown down to you. That speaks of the demonic outpouring of the last days that Paul talked about, John talked about, and Jesus talked about. He says, woe unto you in those days, because Satan is thrown down to you, and he is filled with rage, and he knows his time is short. And right after that, it starts saying how Satan now that he can't touch Jesus anymore. He thought he could on the cross. He thought he was going to destroy him there. But then he realized that was all a trap that he walked into. And now the last of Revelation 12 says he will then turn his attention to those who hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the woman that gave birth to all of that, well, that's Israel, <laughs> the returned Israel. And those who hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ are Jews and Gentiles who are under the blood. We're the church. We're the one new man, Paul talks about in Ephesians 2. And that's where Satan's going to attack. And look, look, listen, as a little microcosm, in Canada, 
you might have been hearing about this pastor that's being persecuted and put in jail because he kept his church open. And right. yeah, yeah, he's, uh, I think he's, I forgot, I think he's from Romania or Polish, something. Polish, I think he's Polish, something like that. Yeah, but maybe Polish or something, yeah. but here's the deal. I heard in, on an interview, uh, Steve Bannon's uh, podcast and interview, and I heard him say, he said, what the world doesn't understand is we have a constitution in Canada and we, and it says, and he read it, that the church cannot be shut down by the government, cannot in Canada for nothing, nothing. Not only did the mayor of Calgary, and by the way, I've done a lot of preaching up in Calgary. I've, I, I know those people and I know that area. I've been up there quite a bit, been over in British Columbia and in Toronto. I've been all over Canada. Right. And the mayor, he said, is Muslim. And mm. the Muslim mayor shut down the Jewish synagogues, the Christian churches, and is and arrested him and is sending troops and cops and SWAT teams to synagogues and churches. But Ramadan was wide open, wide open. Yeah. The mosques weren't touched. <laughs> the crowds of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Muslims gathering in these places weren't even spoken to about it. Now, brother, that is the spirit of Antichrist. And, and it's sweeping the planet. That's a microcosm of it. But that that spirit is everywhere now, and it's getting thicker and thicker, even in the United States, as you know. Right. So so that's kind of where we are. You, you started by asking me about the title, and I just kind of went oh, off great. on the thing. But, <laughs> but anyway, so um, can I explain the parable of the fig tree very quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, because I've mentioned it two or three times, and I know there are some scholars down through the ages who have said, no, that's not what that parable is about. And I include that. I, my, my books are scholarly. I include the other side. Sometimes it's in the footnotes, but I've got things footnoted and you can go. And I say, now this scholar, this scholar, and this scholar disagrees, but here's why I think they're wrong. But here's the deal. When you put it in its context, it slaps you in the face. And that is this. The evening Jesus talked about learn the lesson of the fig tree, they're on the Mount of Olives. They had spent the day in Jerusalem. But that morning, they had come from the Mount of Olives, from Bethany. And there's about a 30-minute walk. They were coming into the city. And it was during Passover week, so it was early spring. That's when the fig trees are budding and blooming, and they produce... Um, almost like a fake fig, because the real figs don't come until July and August. But, but I can't remember the name of it right now. There's a Hebrew word for it, but there are little figs, little, little budding figs, that, and, and people eat them. They're, they're nice little trinket kind of fruits. Right. And they would walk by these orchards of fig trees, and they would pick them and eat them for breakfast or whatever. <laughs> well, they were on their way in, and Jesus with his disciples. Now think about this, man. I mean, don't think of it as a Bible story or a children's right. story. I mean, this is real life. They're coming down off the mountain. They're going into Jerusalem. Jesus knows he's going to the cross. The disciples still can't fathom that, even though he's telling them. They think he means spiritually speaking, you know. Okay. They, they don't have a clue. I mean, they, I mean, at the cross, they ran and hid. Uh, at, at, when the women went to the tomb, they didn't go there to see a resurrected Christ. They went there to anoint a dead body. Then when they found him resurrected, they came back, told the disciples they didn't believe. So, I mean, you know, so Jesus knows they're on their way in. Now, pretend like you and I are disciples. Right. We're going through these, this orchard of fig trees. Jesus walks up to one in particular. And there's no fruit on it. Now, whether it's all been picked or it just hasn't produced, he says it hasn't produced. And he, the old English says he cursed it. That doesn't mean he used a curse word. It, it means right. he just, he condemned it. Right. And he's, and, but, but, it, but it was a parable. He was using it. He said, for three years, I've been coming to you and there's no fruit on this tree. And he said, so now you will not produce fruit again until I return. Or until, you know, you can say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I mean, those kinds of things. That was the condemnation he put on that fig tree. And the Bible says that while the disciples were standing there, you and me standing there, we're watching him do this and we're listening. And within a few minutes of just standing there watching him, the leaves all turn brown and start dropping to the ground. Mm. And the disciples said, what just happened here? He speaks to a, a tree? and it dies. <laughs> he commands it to die, and it dies. It shrivels up. They were freaked out by it, Paul. 
So, but anyway, they went on about their business and I'm sure they probably were asking him, what the heck was that? And he probably <laughs> said something like, now, again, this is my opinion. The Bible doesn't say it, but it, it all adds up. He probably said something. Ask me about that this evening. Ask me again later on today. We've got things to do right now. Uh, you saw what you saw. And there's a meaning behind it. Ask me about it later. Right. So later that night, they're getting ready to go to bed, which is they're camping basically, and you know, under the trees. And they're up on the side of the Mount of Olives. They're looking down over the temple at night. And the disciples are looking at the beauty and the sun's going down and shining off of the temple and the temple mount. And they're saying, oh, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? And that's when he says, you know, not one stone's going to be left upon another. Then they said, oh, well, tell us about your coming. And the when will these things happen? And when will you return? Well, they were assuming that he meant that at his return, the temple would collapse. Right. Well, he knew, no, it was going to collapse in about 40 years from that day. But he didn't even go there with them. He didn't want to even put that on them. He just started answering questions about his return. He never even addressed the answer of the temple, even though he knew exactly when it was. But, but he starts going through this litany of Matthew 24, and the first thing he says when he's done, and then the son of man will call his angels and gather his elect from, from the four corners of the earth. And so shall it be. Now learn the lesson of the fig tree. Now, see that happened that morning. Now it's night. Now Jesus is going to answer. They've probably been pestering him all day long. Listen, I know <laughs> I would have. I said, how in the heck did you do that? And what was that all about? Well, here's the thing. Here's what those good little Jewish guys knew. The, the, the fig tree is used four or five times in the Old Testament to represent the nation of Israel. Uh, so is the olive tree. Those two trees are used for various reasons. And where are they? They're at the Garden of Gethsemane. What does that mean? The olive press. That's where Jesus would go and be tempted and then arrested. That, he was being pressed. Who is he? He's the root. He's the, 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 the branch from the root of, of the stump of Jesse. Uh, what's that? It's an olive stump. He's the branch, the olive tree. Romans 11, Paul talks about the, 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 the Gentiles are grafted into the olive tree. Um, the Jews, those that are not believing, they have been cut off, but they can be regrafted in if they believe. Okay. So the olive tree and then the fig tree is used in the Old Testament four or five times. God says, I came to you uh, as a young fig tree, and, and I pruned you, and I took care of you, and, and you produced fruit for me, you know, several times. So that's why Jesus said to the fig tree, I've come to you for three years now. Why, why would he say that? Because he's getting ready now to fulfill everything. It is finished. Three years of ministry, and he's using it as an example. So on that night, he says, now learn the lesson. That fig tree that I condemned because for three years it has not fed me. It has not produced fruit for me, parabolically speaking. He says, it will come back to life. It will come back to life in the last days. You just asked me what the signs would be. I told you a bunch of them, but one of the biggest signs is the fig tree when it reblooms. Mm. Those disciples then knew what he was talking about, but he still wouldn't give them a date. He just said, the generation that's going to see it happen. See, Jesus knew it would be 2,000 years from then. He knew the disciples couldn't even fathom that amount of time. I mean, that would be an eternity. It would be like, well, let's, you know, why even preach the gospel, man, if you're not going to come <laughs> for 2,000 2, years? Right. So he doesn't want to do that to them, but he just says, there's coming a generation that's going to see the fig tree rebloom. And that generation, you and me. See, there's decades between our age, right. but yet, so you represent one gen, you represent a younger generation than I am. Yet neither one of us um, have ever in our life, we, all we've ever known is Israel there. So we're a part together of that generation. Okay. And Jesus told the disciples, he said, that generation that sees the fig tree rebloom, will not even pass away when everything's going to happen. It's going to, Daniel said, it's going to come like a flood. I, I'm telling you, Paul, people all over the world are saying that right now. Even people that don't know the word of God, they're saying, what's happening? The world's mm -hmm. going crazy. 
all of these governments and they're beating people down and crushing people and putting us in our homes. They're masking us up. Now they're demanding we take us an experimental vaccine that alters our DNA. And it, and it literally does. The, the chief Memory. medical yeah. officer of Moderna um, is on TED Talks. You can go on YouTube and hear him say it. He said it five years ago when they were just getting this technology going long before COVID. He said he was so excited. He said, we're literally rewriting your DNA. We're changing the code of life. Those are his words. He's the inventor of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, you say that now people say, oh, you know, you, you conspiracy theorist, you, you, you science denier. That's not what's happening. Well, the guy <laughs> that made it said that long before COVID. And so, you know, people are seeing this stuff, Paul, and they don't even know the word. They don't know the prophecies. They don't believe Jesus is Messiah and God in the flesh. But those of us that do, we have the Holy Spirit. Now we have eyes to see and ears to hear. And again, I've been preaching, teaching, studying, digging, pulling it apart, approaching the word of God like a criminal investigator for decades. And God has kind of shown me these things. Now, again, I don't think I have it all perfect, but I think I got a lot of it in line. You know, I can see where it's headed and the unprecedented things that are happening. In our generation, Israel's back, unprecedented. In our generation, technology. When Israel was born, Paul, um, you, you of course, weren't even born. No. Uh, it, it, and, and, but when it was born, there were only three TV channels. They were all black and white. And the only way you could get them is, is if the man could get his wife to go outside and turn, or his kids to turn the <laughs> antenna, you know, right. the rabbit ears. And, 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 and news was two or three, four days behind all the time because you had to get it. You had to film it in Israel. Then you had to get it on an airplane and get it back. You had to get it developed. And then you had to get it edited and produced. And then you showed it on the evening news four or five days after it happened. Right. So that was technology. That was it. Uh, we hadn't landed on the moon. We hadn't even thought about that. You know, uh, we had just dropped a nuclear bomb. And so the nuclear age was beginning, but it was very, very young and it was nasty. And we were still reeling from all of that. Right. So, I mean, that's the technology. And I mean, we still had, we still had, if you had a telephone, it was a party line. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, and we went from that in 73 years to where we are now. You and I are using technology on doing this show right now using yeah. the internet we're using software that produces these shows everything and it's and now you know vaccines that turn switches off and on and rewrite our genetic code and crispr cas9 and you know and mixing animal and human flesh which by the way goes to the days of noah mm -hmm. when god said all flesh is being corrupted he said i'm going to take the only humans that aren't corrupted, that word corrupted, wow. I mean, people. a lot of people think they mean sexually or morally. It can also mean your actual DNA makeup. Something horrific was going on. Genesis 6 gives us the clue. In those days, the sons of God, the only time that phrase is used in the Bible, five times, six times, it, it means angels. But they were coming unto the daughters of men something was happening there said so having children by them i mean you know i mean it just gets really freaky and people don't like hearing it they don't even like preaching it or teaching it they try to explain it away but the hebrew words say what they say right. and 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 then god destroyed everything paul because he said all flesh is corrupt animals see what why do we think why does anybody think that that God, the Bible, three different times in Genesis, it says God brought the animals to Noah. God did it. Now, see, God didn't tell Noah, go out and find the animals. He says, now, when, when you get them, I want you to bring them in two by two, et cetera, et cetera. But the Bible says God brought them to Noah in the last seven days. He brought them to him. And then they were kind of storing them up in the ark after he'd been building it for 120 years. Right. So, and then God killed everything except for what was on that ark. He brought his wrath. And so, I mean, brother, you know, if you'll think about where we are now with the return of Israel, technology, all of the technologies of the Bible are already in place. The Bible talks about how the whole world will see the 
the beast. Well, how can the whole world 2,000 years ago see one man somewhere, wherever he is, Washington, D.C., or Rome, or, you know, in the Middle East, and Jerusalem, wherever that guy is, how can the whole world see him at once? Well, now, we don't, I mean, we, we don't even question that. But for 2,000 years, until about 20 years ago, people still didn't know, how, how's that going to happen? I mean, you know, TV maybe, but even then, you know, the news was delayed, right. you know? So then it talks about the whole world will receive a mark that identifies them. That was written 2000 years ago. How is that? First of all, that, that could be a technology as rudimentary as just a tattoo right. or something much more advanced, but how are you gonna get 7 billion people to take a mark? COVID passports. There's got, yeah, there's <laughs> got to be a trigger. And, and I think the vaccine passports are at least, I'm not prepared to say that is the mark of the beast yet. And I know some people are screaming right now because they think it is and they're mad at me. But I, I just, I take things like an investigator. I, I watch it. I do say it certainly is at least a dry run right. to show us because now billions of people all over the planet are going, give me the, give me the mark, give me the mark. I want the mark. I don't want to die. They're afraid of death. See, and the Bible says in the last days, people will be saying peace and safety, the Antichrist, peace and safety. Come to me, take the mark, peace and safety. So whatever it is, I think this is it. It may turn out that it is. I mean, if it really alters the genetics and we won't know for a few years, right? Right. So all these billions of people taking it. What, what are the outcome? I don't know. World Health Organization, just two or three re weeks ago, I read it in mainstream media, went to my radio program with it and read it over the air. They said, you know, first of all, these vaccines are not working nearly like we thought they would. And secondly, they said, we don't know what the long-term effects are. So they said, we do not recommend vaccine passports. In other words, we don't recommend that you make people get them because this is still experimental. And I appreciate them saying that, although they've really been nefarious in this whole thing. But they did say that. Uh, that was about the same time that Biden came out and said, I'm not going to require vaccine passports. Well, he can't under federal law in America right. because it's EUA, uh, the Emergency Use Authorization Act. And it says anything that's experimental uh, cannot be forced upon the population. Right. And it is an EUA vaccine. Yeah. So all the of this. Experimental till 2023, I think, is when that when that finally ends and then after that yeah. it's who knows what yeah. else <laughs> then it's wide open so we may be looking at some really well we are looking if we're still here brother we're looking at some tough times coming i mean we are and, and for god's people listening to this jesus said do not fear you believe in god believe also in me i've got this i'm taking care of this peter said it like this isn't this interesting he says just like it was in the days of noah God knew how to take care of Noah. I'm paraphrasing, but he said, Noah was a preacher of righteousness, yet God took care of him. Then he said, and Lot, who was vexed, this is the King James, vexed in his righteous soul at the evil and filth that he was forced to endure every day, yet God took care of him and delivered him by angels. Noah, it says God delivered him in the ark right when the flood came. In other words, before God poured out his wrath in both of those days, he, he took his people out. You can call it a rapture, whatever you want to call it. He sent his angels to come get them. He took his people out of the way. We have not been appointed to suffer God's wrath. In the meantime, we are being called to be the Noahs and the Lots. We are living in a global spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah, and I think it's going to get worse and worse. Uh, and God will take care of us if we're serving him, not just because your name's on a church roll mm -hmm. or just because you say, I believe in God. Well, good for you. So does Satan and the demons. They mm -hmm. believe in God too. That doesn't make, but if we're born again, if Jesus is our reason for living, if we're speaking the truth, if we're living like Lot right in the middle of the filth, but yet witnessing to his neighbors, loving his neighbors and going to work every day, doing his job, but never denying the Lord, God took him out with angels. Noah, 120 years building an aircraft carrier sized ship in his backyard. <laughs> and, and the world rejected him. They called him a conspiracy theorist and they called him a prepper. 
Noah was the world's first prepper, mega prepper, and they mocked him. But you know what? God spared him and killed everybody else. So, you know, that's the whole message of the Bible is wrapped around this. When Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross, he said, learn the lesson of the fig tree. And also know it's going to be just like the days of Noah in the last days. And he had also said that a couple months earlier down on the Jordan River Valley Road. So that's where the whole book comes from. And I, I want to tell you, audience, if, they, if they're if they not familiar with any of my writing, and this will, that's my 11th book. Um, God has just really, really blessed all of that. I'm, I'm a top 60 Amazon bestselling author and have been. I've been all over media. I still am. And God's using this stuff. And, and one of the ways that I write not only do I show you the word studies and the scholarship, but I do it at, at a level that people that are in the church that like to read, they'll get it. It's not written for seminary PhDs. I mean, they, they, they love it too, but I'm saying I don't write at that level. I just write at our level where we just like we're talking here. That's how it's the books are written just like we're talking. And the, but another thing that I do that people really like is for a section of the book, eight or 10, 12, 15 chapters, and all my chapters are only like five pages each. Um, I immerse you in the biblical narrative. I have you walking along the road with Jesus on the Jordan River Valley Road. I put you at the foot of the cross while he's being crucified. I put you on the Mount of Olives with his disciples when he's teaching them and them asking questions and, and they're being upset. Why did you kill that fig tree? And, you know, and I make it, it's like watching a movie. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and so, you know, um, by the way, at the end of uh, the summoning, after you finish the whole book, but then there's an addendum of about 10 more chapters, again, five pages each, so about 50 more pages, that's called Be Thou Prepared. And I wrote a book years ago called Be Thou Prepared. I saw this day coming, and I was telling the church, be prepared spiritually <laughs> and physically, and I don't care if people call you a prepper. Here's what you do. Now, people who prepared when COVID-19 came and the lockdowns and the shutdowns came, they were so glad that they had been listening to people like me right. because they were prepared. <laughs> and we were mocked for years. We were mocked about storing up food and water and medicine. But then it came to the point where they said, oh my gosh, I'm so glad we're prepared. Well, I think it's going to get worse. And I don't tell people, I tell people, don't panic. Don't go out and buy up all the toilet paper in the store tomorrow. But just slowly but surely, stock up, supply up, kind of get ready for tough times. Uh, we're not running from anything. We're not hiding from anything. But what do you do when the military troops roll in, the National Guard sticks bazookas in your face and says, get in your house? I mean, you know, it didn't quite happen that bad in the United States, but people ran and did what the government said because they were threatened that if they didn't, they would go to jail or lose their businesses or whatever. So Churches were shut down. Preachers were put in jail. People were fined in the United States of America. Right. I think about that, brother. But anyway, it's, thanks for that so much. No, no worries. It's been kind of crazy. I mean, not not so much here in Texas. We haven't we didn't really shut down like shut down like everywhere else. Um, even here where I live, it's, it hasn't been as bad. I mean, you still have to wear masks certain places here and there. Um, but nobody says anything if you don't wear them outside. We don't have like any kind of crazy people running around like that. But, um, you know, to your point there, when you spoke earlier about how the church was being shut down, things like that. I mean, I've always felt that COVID was kind of used. I mean, like here in Dallas. Yeah, like here in Dallas, they, they had churches closed down. And even when they opened up, you had to wear a mask. And if you didn't wear them, they didn't let you in or, you know, stuff like that. Um, but like, how do Christians, I want to say, f I guess, push back, fight back? Because, you know, obviously a lot of Christians will point to turn the other cheek. That's always like a big thing. Yeah. But that's it's just not going to cut it anymore. It's, it, 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 it's not going to cut it anymore because obviously they've been closing down churches. You can't worship anywhere, you know besides inside your house where it's recommended that you still wear a mask, even if you live with all these people in your house. But I mean, have a lot of, a lot of people out there who are Christians, they feel and they're right that they're being discriminated against. And you see it like in the news, you see it in it's all movies, over the world. you see it on the internet and all kinds of things, people bashing Christians. And it's, it's been going on for a long time, but if you I've say got anything, it all documented in my book, all over the world headlines, it's the yeah. Christian's fault. The yeah. Christian's 
fault that COVID and, is spreading. Yep. And, and nobody seems to care because if you say something about Mohammed, then it's a big deal. Yeah. And people will go yeah. insane. They'll start burning things down. Obviously, we won't go to that extent. But what kind of advice do we give to people yeah. to where they don't feel helpless, like yeah. it's, they're being discriminated against and they just can't do anything about it? Yeah. Well, listen, I can say this hypothetically. If and this would never happen, but if all the pastors of all the churches and all the Christians of all the churches all over the world had said, no, we're not closing down. There would have been outbreaks of put this pastor in jail, take this church away, but it would have been almost impossible to deal with billions of people and hundreds of thousands of churches. The governments of the world couldn't have handled it, but they developed this narrative of like it's the black plague, the bubonic plague. And it's not, I mean, under certain demographics, it's very serious, uh, but the overall survival rate is 99.7 or 99.9% .9 unless you're in your sixties, I mean, seventies or eighties with underlying conditions, right. then it's still 99.4% survival rate, but yet they turned it into the bubonic plague in the people's minds, 24 right. seven pummeling is still, they're still doing it until governments, mayors, city councils, county commissioners seize power over our constitution. They passed laws, rules, regulations. In our county, we're shutting the churches down, you know, but yet casinos were open because they were making money for them. Uh, all Walmart. the big box stores were open. <laughs> uh, you know, everybody that gave money to their campaigns, they were open. Um, I mean, just evil. It was just weaponized. It was weaponized against the whole election. And that's another whole hour show we could do. It was weaponized primarily for that. And then they saw the power. They watched Christians and pastors run to the hills and churches shut their doors. And they said, wow, we didn't know it was going to be this easy. Let's use this. And I'm not judging any pastors or churches because everybody lived in different areas and they were under different threats. Some churches probably needed to close if they were in a high infection area. Maybe the pastor was 80 years old and most of the people were 60, 70, 80. Maybe they needed to close. But I'm just saying, hypothetically, if more pastors, more churches all over the world had just stood and said, no, Hebrews 10, that's our marching orders. Do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but rather continue to meet, and even more so as you see the day approaching, the Bible says, Hebrews 10, verse 24, 25, 26. So um, I can tell you what we did in our church in just a moment. Use your head, follow good science. Boy, a lot of lying and a lot of, a lot of false information and a lot of twisting and perverting and changing, constant changing of information. And all that's part of the psychological warfare, warfare brother. I right. mean, Every communist nation does that to this day. They change the information and tell you the rules and you keep the rules. And then the next day they change them. And if you try to keep the rule from yesterday, they put you in jail today. I mean, it's just a way of beating you into submission. It's almost like Marine boot camp where they tell you what to do. You wake up the next morning and do it. And they beat you down and make you do push-ups because you did what they told you to do yesterday. And they'll <laughs> look at you and say, but that's not today. And they're just, what they're doing is they're just, getting you, and this is good, the Marines are getting you to follow orders, regardless of who says it or how stupid it is, because in war, that'll save your life. It'll save the life of your platoon. But out here in the culture, that's called communism. That's called mass psychological warfare. Uh, and that's what they've done with this. And it's still going on all over the world. And so, so anyway, okay. Um, I'm going to tell you about our church, and, and I can't say that every church should have done or should do what I'm doing and what we're doing, because I live in Florida, and we never really were under a statewide mass mandate, although, or a church closure mandate. In fact, the, gov the governor said, no, churches are essential. We're not closing them. You don't have to go if you don't want to, but if you want to, you can. Um, yet, in the area I live, in the heart of the Bible Belt, almost every church around is closed anyway. Oh. They just, and to this day, in a, in a state that's never had a mask mandate, 90% of the people are wearing masks, riding their bicycles, walking outside, either Walmart driving their cars, and they got those filthy rags hanging over their rear view mirrors and hanging around their necks, and it's virtue signaling. They've been conditioned to do whatever the government says, thinking they're protecting their health and your health and my health, and they're not. 
They're just not, and that we'd need an, another hour show to prove that, but um, they do not stop viruses. They do not stop viruses. They do not. And so to go through all of that is, is just crazy, but see, they've been conditioned. Um, so here's what we did at our church. I'm just going to admit to you, Paul, in the early days, nobody, even Donald Trump, n- nobody, even Fauci and all of them didn't really know what this was. Was it some kind of biological weapon China unleashed on us? I still think that might be what it was. But regardless of the fact, we didn't know. We didn't know how deadly it would be. We didn't know how devastating. Think about what the government was mostly concerned about. You got to keep your military healthy. What if they wipe out all of our trained personnel? and our pilots and, and our, you know, our ship commanders and our, 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 the people that operate our nuclear silos. What if they all get sick and die or they're laying up in bed? I mean, brother, that would be a way to take out a nation, a superpower. Mm-hmm. So they didn't know. And so I was willing, I told my staff um, and our church, I said, look, we're going to see what the government s- says. We're going to see what our governor says. Not that I follow the, the lead of the government, but but let's wait and see what this is. If it's the black bubonic plague that's going to kill half of our population, then we're going to have to do something drastic. But if it turns out being, you know, like Fauci and those guys were saying early on, that it's going to be basically just a really, really bad flu season. And that's what it's turned out to be, a really, really bad flu season. Um, That's a different thing. And so I told the church, well, anyway, it came into April and May, and we were already realizing, okay, It might have been a weapon of some sort. The Democrats, the liberals surely have weaponized it against an election and everything, but it doesn't look like this is the bubonic plague. So is is it bad? Yes. So here's what we did at our church. The governor said, you don't have to close churches. Governor said, you don't have to wear masks. He said, I suggest you do, you know, and I suggest that you uh, social distance, uh, but I'm not going to suggest you close the churches. Well, so it was fairly easy for me to take a stand of faith. So say I'm putting myself down here I, I, because I'm not trying to make your audience think that, oh, I'm just this big, bad, brave dude that whatever <laughs> comes my way. Um, I pray I've got faith no matter what, but I never ran in fear, but I was just kind of waiting to measure it out. Remember, that's that cop mentality. Right. See what the facts were. Then when the governor said, you don't have to close down, And I had already told my staff, I said, look, if the governor orders us to close, we will close, but only for a temporary. I mean, they're saying in a couple of weeks, well, look, it's been over a year now and they've still got us closed all over the place. And and so I said that I told my staff, I said, I will not do that. And I said, you don't have to work here anymore if you don't want to. You don't have to come if you feel your life's in danger because of my policies. I'm not some cult leader. You, You don't have to do that. I said, but if the governor shuts us down, we'll close for a few weeks and we'll measure it again and see what's going on. I said, but I'm not going to close the church indefinitely. But when the governor said, you don't have to close it, then I said, we're not going to. I told my staff, I said, but you still don't have to come. I said, but you're going to have to work from home if you want to get your paycheck. And, Mm -hmm. but, but you don't have to come, but, and there's all kinds of ways we could do that. But I said, we're going to live stream for those that don't want to come. And for those that do, we're going to put uh, 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 remote places even on our campus. In our fellowship hall, we had remote uh, uh, sanctuary built over there. In our big choir suite, we had another remote location built there. Then the sanctuary is a large sanctuary. People could social distance if they wanted. I told them, you can wear a mask if you want. You don't have to. Nobody's going to make fun of you. I'm not going to shame you from the pulpit. You do whatever you want. This is not some cult. We treat adults like adults, but the church is going to be open. I'm going to be here preaching into that camera, even if I'm the only one here, me and the camera operator. Well, but that never happened, brother. We've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that have been coming from day one. Nice. And we've gone through the whole thing. The place is packed out. We've got visitors from all over the nation and even the world now coming to our church because they know what we've done and what God has done. But we weren't arrogant about it. I had the first three or four Sundays during that when all the other churches around us were closing and all over the United States, and there was still fear. I mean, even I had a little trepidation. I wasn't walking around in fear, but it's like, did I do the right thing? God, you got to help me here. And 
And then I just had what I called holy convocations, you know, like the Old Testament guy. I mean, I just took scripture. I read it over the church. I read it over the people. We had prayer time. I would read God's word where he promises to deliver us from pestilence and disease and sickness when we're standing in the word, particularly in the last days and not giving up meeting. And I kept reading that and about peace, you know, think on these things. And then the peace of God will transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. I just prayed over the church and we made a promise to God. I said, Lord, I'm not bargaining with you. We're just standing in your word. We're believing your word. All I ask is that you, I'm not asking that you not let anybody get sick because we live in a fallen world. Some, some of us are going to get sick. I said, I'm not even asking that you not let anybody die. I'm just saying, God, since we're going to go on with the work of the church, please, we're, we're praying by faith that you will not let this thing wipe us out so that we look stupid, your word looks stupid, and and it ruins our faith and testimony. And I said, we will not be arrogant. We will not claim that we were big and bad and bold and brave. We will claim that you did it. Right. And brother, I'm sitting here in front of you telling you that happened in March or April of 2020. So here we are a year later. Now the COVID was around before then. It started back in December of 2019. That's why it's called COVID-19. I haven't even had a sniffle. (laughs) And brother, all during that time, I was on airplanes. I was doing media. I was in and out of Atlanta airport, Dallas airport. I was at conferences until they shut all that down around thousands of people. And during the whole time I've been in my church around hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, children, everybody hugging You know, now I'm careful. I mean, I wash my hands. I told people, wash your hands like flu season. If you got a fever, please stay home. If you're diagnosed with COVID, stay home until you're over it. Just like when you have the flu, don't be bringing your babies up here and putting them in the nursery when they've got fevers. I said, let's just use our heads. And if you want to wear a mask, do. If you don't, you don't have to. Anyway, we went on with life and ministry and we're here a year, year and a half later. I haven't even had a sniffle. We've had zero people die. I've done zero COVID funerals from our church. Um, We've had zero people put on respirators. We had two people that went to the hospital, got it. They were elderly. They had underlying conditions. They were told they were probably going to die. They were told they were probably going to go on a respirator, but they didn't even, they weren't coming. They were watching us online and they got it. I mean, they weren't coming to church, but we prayed over them. And said, God, please preserve them for your namesake. Just preserve them. They should have died. Brother, both of them went through it. They were sick, but they didn't even go on a respirator. They were healed. They came home, and now they're in church every Sunday. And neither one of them wear masks either. They just, they just get on with life. They just learned faith. It's faith. It's faith. It's faith. And washing your hands and taking care of yourself. I mean, it's (laughs) it's both. It's both, right? Yeah. It's like a Christian surgeon. He has faith and he prays before every surgery, but he also washes his hands mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? and he wears a mask. Now the mask isn't to stop viruses. Nah. Surgeons will tell you it doesn't stop a virus. If a surgeon has a virus, like a cold virus, they won't let him operate. You say, will he wear a mask? No, mask doesn't stop viruses. They know that. He wears a mask to keep from throwing up in somebody's body cavity or spitting or sneezing on somebody. Also, it helps to keep like if they're doing heart surgery and they nick a vein and blood splatter and it doesn't go in their mouth and up their nose. There's a reason for wearing a mask, but it's not to stop viruses because it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I felt um, I think like this is what I think. So I I I think my son and I had COVID-19 back in like December of 2019. I'm fairly positive because we were both. I've heard heard a lot of people say that. We're we're like both down and like we're out of it for like three weeks. Like we're just really bad. I mean, nothing too serious. It just felt like a, like the flu, but just slightly worse. Yeah. Um, so I think that, that we like had COVID, it then. brother. I'm yeah. not trying to play doctor, but that's what it sounds <laughs> like. Yeah. So it's like, we felt like I got sick for like two weeks and then it was real bad. And then I got over it for like f- four or five days. And then I had it again for like a week. So I, I'm fairly certain that's exactly what it was. But yeah. um, as we wind down here, uh, sir, I just wanted to see, um, actually, can you let everybody know where they can actually buy your book as well as where they can see your show? Yeah. As, as well? Thanks. Thanks. All of my books are sold everywhere. Good books are sold. Secular bookstores, Christian bookstores, online, brick and mortar stores, and or you can get them directly from me. 
uh, and I will sign them. If you live in the United States, it's free shipping and the prices on them are the same or less than you can get them on Amazon or anywhere else. Yeah. But um, so it's a good deal, but, but you can buy them anywhere you want. And, and, uh, but go to my website, carlgallops.com, my name.com. And there's an email there and a phone number there. And you can actually get a live person on the phone and as uh, one of my staff, but you tell them what you're doing, what you want, they'll take care of you. You can, or if you don't want to talk, you just send an email, we'll handle it. Somebody will contact you and we'll get it going and we'll do anything we can. We can do bulk deals. We can do, I mean, like I said, I'm not, I'm not in the book selling business. I don't handle any of that. Right. And we cut deals with people. And if somebody has got a ministry and they need 10 or 15 books, and if it's a, a, a really legit ministry, we'll just ship them to them. We just give them to them. Um, but if it's somebody that wants to buy a bunch and they say, no, 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 we want to pay you, then we'll sell them to them at cost. You know, whatever we have to pay for it, we'll sell it. And so some people say, well, I, I want you to autograph it for me. I'm going to give this to my mama or something. I'll do that. Right. I mean, so you can order them from me or anywhere else you want, but you can get them most anywhere. Now the summoning right now, as we're speaking is sold out everywhere. Yeah, um, they're, they're being re <laughs> yeah, no, it is. I mean, everywhere, uh, but they're being reprinted. It'll be a week or two, but I still have a few boxes in our offices. So people can still get a few from me if they, if they want, but, uh, but they'll be available soon. They just, yeah. God's really blessing it. Yeah. I would definitely be on the horn to get one as well. Cause I was really interested in, I, in reading it. So I was kind of disappointed when I tried to order one, I think it was about a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks or something like that. And I just couldn't find them anywhere in that, like on I'm, Amazon. What I'm like, telling you. They're like freaking double the price on Amazon. I, like know. For people. I like, know that makes me so mad. See, here's what happens. I have nothing to do with that. And, yeah, I, and, yeah. and we, our ministry gets no royalties from that. What mm -hmm. happens is they, a lot of that is pirated brother. Mm -hmm. They there's with, there's the technology. Now they can take a PDF right. uh, Kindle version and they can scan it and yeah. reproduce the cover and everything. And then they will sell them for twice what, yeah. Amazon or my publisher would sell them for, but here's Amazon's rule is that if we can't supply them, we're the primary suppliers. I say we, my publisher, um, then the third market people, I mean, it's wide open and that happens all the time. So that's why I say, if you can't find it on Amazon, get it from me, we'll get you a, a good price. And by the way, I want you to use that email, Paul, or however you've been contacting Right. And give us a mailing address for you, and I will I will give you one. I will oh, send. Awesome! To I really appreciate it. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so we'll definitely be doing that. Um, also, before we take off here, can we? Can you get? I guess give the people out there a little last words of wisdom here, so they can help. Yep. You know, help them feel yep. a little better. Maybe. Yep. All the stuff that's been going on this year. Hopefully, we kind of make our way out of it, but it doesn't yep. seem like it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, listen, I'm a pastor. I have a heart for God's people in the church and just people in general. And so I just say, listen, if you're born again, if you're not born again, now's the time. <laughs> but, but if you are, listen, we've been called to be the salt, to be the light. You know, I'm just quoting scripture. We've been raised up for such a time as this. I mean, don't give up, just, just do life. And the other thing is I tell people, look, mow the grass, pay the bills, educate the children, save for the future. Nobody knows the day or the hour. We're living in very prophetic times. Things are happening quickly. Things are changing quickly. Nothing ever stays the same. I tell people that all the time. Don't live your life in anxiety. That's the opposite of faith. It's, a, it's an affront to, to the Lord to walk around all day and say, I'm scared, I'm scared. I'm scared. Why? Your heavenly father's got this. Don't right. act like that. Just get out there. Now's the time you can minister to people. Now people are listening. Now's the time to be especially kind to people. I, t I tell you, I, I really, pr I'm enjoying myself, not that all the heck that's going on, but I mean, <laughs> in the middle of it, I, I look for opportunities to be especially nice to people, you know, just out in the public and Walmart or in a hospital elevator and just holding the door for people saying, God bless you, you know, have a Jesus filled Lord's day, have a Jesus filled day. I'll say things like that all the time. And man, people just flock to you either. They don't even know who I am. They don't know I'm a pastor. Right. They just, who's this guy? It's so happy with life. And so they'll say, what's going on? And so I get to witness to them. So that's what I tell God's people. Just get on with life, but don't stick your head in the dirt either and say, well, preacher said, get on with life. So I'm, not, I'm just going to pretend like nothing's happening. No, something's happening. <laughs> the Bible tells us this. So 
but that's that's what I tell people. And if you're not born again, then 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 it's time to be saved. Acts three nineteen uh, says it like this: Repent, turn to God, and repent of your sin for the refreshing of your soul, so that God can bring you days of refreshing. Acts three nineteen: Repent, turn to God. Now, but. Romans 10, 9 says how to turn to God, it says this, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. And Romans 10, 13 says, and whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord like this shall be saved. So I, I just tell people, look, it's just time to get real and to get right. And, uh, and I tell the church people that say, well, I'm already born again. Well, then get real, get as real as you can. This is as real as it gets right here. And, um, uh, so anyway, but none of us are guaranteed another day, Paul. I mean, you can sit around and worry and wring your hands. And then two days later, a truck runs a stop sign and kills you. And, yeah, I mean, you know, you're standing in front of the Lord. So you can't live your life in fear of death. You can't be so afraid to die that you quit living. I, that's what I tell people. So that's how I'm living my life. I think it's biblical and the Lord's honoring me. And there's a lot of other people out there like me that's living like this and God's blessing. Right. Yeah. And I think as soon as the sooner the better we can all get in front of the Lord, I think that would be a lot better for all of us because uh, Lord knows we need it. <laughs> the, yeah. you know, the way everything's been going on lately. But um, yeah, well, hopefully we get there one day a lot sooner than later. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, Thanks absolutely. For having me on. No, absolutely. So I really appreciate your time. Um, we'll definitely be reaching out in the future as well. But um, everybody else will be linking all the links down below uh cargallops.com as well as the links to the books where everybody can go and find them as, as well as email addresses and the phone number as well um we'll definitely be linking all the social media as well as soon as i put everything up um but yeah like if you guys are trying to catch us on youtube and you aren't a subscriber already like i mentioned before please hit that subscribe button as well as that bell icon and that like button as well that'll really help us out uh you can catch us on spotify google podcast apple podcast as well as iheart radio at truth defender podcast all of our social media will be linked down below as well twitter instagram facebook rumble and discord uh our me page as well that we just got up and running so that'll be good um and if and like i mentioned before if you guys have any questions or comments for myself or our guests uh and you guys are topic recommendations you can send that over to us at the truth defender 1776 at gmail.com and we'll go ahead and shoot them on out everybody i really appreciate your time everybody stopping in for another episode um also for all of you that are catching us on spotify as well i believe we picked up a lot of viewers recently um germany was the latest one i think um i really appreciate you guys stopping in for the show as well as people in japan and in portugal as well i believe was the latest one um so i really appreciate you guys picking up the show out there as well showing your support for us um, check us out on youtube as well like i mentioned um so everybody else i really appreciate you stopping by like i mentioned already stay blessed Stay safe, stay blessed, and most of all, stay frosty. Perfect. <laughs>